All right, how many of you came ready to receive from the Lord today? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if we didn't, then we're just playing church, and that's not going to help you at all. And uh, you can sense the presence of the Lord. In the house, and the presence of the Lord comes, the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Okay? So when God's Spirit comes and the presence of the Lord comes, it comes with a purpose in mind to help us, to set us free. And we're in this series called Freedom, and that's what we're believing for. We're all believing that we're going to see new levels of freedom and victory in our lives as we go into this year. Can I get an amen, everybody? Come on. Um, if you got a Bible, okay, I want you to go to the book of Joshua, okay? We're going to go to Joshua chapter 1, okay? How many of you have figured out that life is not a straight line of upward momentum? <laughs> got everybody's attention there, right? Uh, over the 43 years I've been alive, there's been a lot of victories, um, but there's been lots of mistakes. Anybody with me? Life can often feel more like the stock market. A lot of ups, a lot of downs, you know? Um, it was funny. Uh, Jess's mom sent her some pictures, some old pictures, and so I wanted to share a couple today. Um, here's one. Put up this first one. Look at this guy. <laughs> Okay, um, this is the day that um, I told everybody I was going to cook for everybody. And, and here, we're just gonna have a moment of therapy for me. Um, I, I know I talk a lot about Jess not being able to cook, but this is a moment in my life that I wasn't able to cook. And so uh, I remember that day I thought, I'm gonna make grilled chicken for everybody. And you know, I was out there and you know, it looked really good. I mean, it had great grill marks on it. It smelled good, had awesome barbecue sauce on it. Um, and then we brought it inside and everybody was super hungry. We had a big party of people and, and we brought it inside and we tore open and just realized it was raw as raw could be. And, and that was definitely not a victory in, in my life. And we decided to order pizza that night. And so... Um, next picture, put up that next one. Look at this thing, okay? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm like, who is that guy? And who are those people? Um, that was when I was interning, okay? And this, I, I believe this was the last, uh, one of the last nights of my internship and I had the opportunity to speak and, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, at that season of my life, I was just so nervous and, um, anybody know those feelings? You're just so incredibly nervous. And, um, and Jess was excited because, you know, we were getting married, and, and I was going to be a pastor, and as a pastor, you have to speak. So this is the first time that she was going to hear me speak, and so she was excited about that. And, and so me and Jess were talking about that picture uh, the other night, and she said, I, I got to tell you. And I mean, we've never talked about this day like it, ever in the last like 22 years. She said, I got to tell you, I was so excited that night. But you did not make any sense at all. She's like, <laughs> she's like, I was literally thinking to myself, this has to be the worst message I've ever heard in my entire life. And I'm about to marry this guy. And uh and I thought, oh, I thank God for young love, right? I mean, just thank God. Um, so we've all had, you know, ups and downs. We've all had failures. Um, I know over the 20 years that we've been married, we've had a lot of challenges. We've also seen a lot of victories. But here's what I've learned the only way that you can ever find freedom in your life is by holding on to Jesus really tight. It's the only way. So the other night, I, um, the Lord said, go to Joshua 1. And, um, and I kind of had this moment where 
Anybody know this feeling where you're like, you think you heard God, but you, you're not sure you heard God, and you're like, hey, well, woo, you know? And so um, I was watching, put up that picture, I was watching the Cavs game in the background. You know, anybody do this? You, you're working on something, but you have something like playing in the background. I usually have sports playing in the background. And, and so I'm, you know, working on this thing that I feel like God is leading me in Joshua chapter one for us today, but I'm also doubting it at the same time. I'm like having one of those moments. And out of nowhere, like, I hear the announcer on the TV say this. Here, I want, I want to play this for you. Hey, Bucks offense reminding you of the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness for 40 years right now. Almost a biblical type of slump. And I thought, I thought, God, you are so good. You'll use a basketball game just to reassure me, like, hey, you're good. You're at the right spot. So come on, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, that you lead us to victory in life today. Joy in the Holy Spirit in you, Lord. We worship you. We praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Can you get real loud for the worship team this morning? All right, here we go. Joshua chapter one, uh, verse one, it says, after the death of Moses, Moses was the one that led the Israelites out of bondage and slavery, trying to lead them to the promised land. Unfortunately, Moses never spent a day in the promised land. He died in the wilderness. The Lord spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant, and he said, Moses, my servant is dead, therefore the time has come to lead the people of Israel across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving them. Remember that God never forgets his promises. There may be seasons in your life that things don't look like they're going in the right direction, but God has not forgotten. God knows what he's doing in your life. He said, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on the land that I'm giving you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north to the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. Now, here's what's really interesting about what God just spoke to him. He's giving him the land um, Lines. He's giving them the coordinates of what Israel, this is God's promised land. He's telling them, no matter what person in the world tells you something different, this is what I've promised to my people, Israel. This is their land, and this is their borders. Okay, this is what the true borders of Israel are. He told me, he said, no one would be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail or abandon you. You need to hear that today. God will never fail or abandon you. As long as you stay close, he is right there with you. Verse six, he gives him a command. Be strong, confident, courageous, for you will give this people an inheritance of the land which I swore to their fathers and ancestors to give to them. Okay, when, when God speaks to Joshua, when God speaks to us, okay, he is releasing three things, power, authority, and grace. When God speaks, he releases power, authority, and grace. So the Lord is releasing power, authority, and grace to a generation that needs it to go into the promised land, okay? Now, I wanna look at these three words that God purposely picked to speak over them, okay? And, I, and I'd never seen this until the other night, okay? It was really cool what the Lord showed me. And so we're gonna start with the first word, strong. God told them, I need you to be strong. And I feel the Lord speaking that over us today. I need my people to be strong. I need strong people in the Lord for the day and the time that we live in. 
The world does not need to see a weak church. The world needs to see a strong church. So God says, I need you to be strong, but I have to believe this, that there is no way that Israel, after spending 40 years in the wilderness, felt strong, right? 40 years. I, I thought about this the other night. The Lord reminded me of this. They ate quail and manna for 40 years straight. It would be like if God came to you and said, hey, uh, I'm gonna let you eat bread and chicken breast for the next 40 years every day for the next 40 years. You'd be like, it's just time to go home to heaven, right? <laughs> like, I'm out. No way. They've been in the wilderness wandering in a circle for 40 years. They've been eating quail and manna for 40 years. And, and I, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what, what were you doing with the quail and manna thing? This is really, like, upsetting me, okay? I'm a... I just can't get past this. Like, are you gonna force me into a season like this someday? I'm like, please, God, don't, you know? And I was asking the Lord, what was it with the quail and the manna? And the Lord said to me, he said, one generation were slaves and one generation were free. The one that were slaves, they don't trust the master, they fear the master because they were slaves. Did you get that? Slaves don't trust the master, they fear the master. So the next generation, God had to teach the next generation how to trust him so that they could go into the promised land. So for 40 years, there's been a generation that has seen God will provide every day just as he said he would. Might not be a steak dinner, right? Might not be exactly what I want, but I've seen consistently every day for 40 years over and over that God is faithful. I can trust him. I can see his provision, and I know that when the time comes for us to go into the promised land, I can trust him now, because I don't fear him, because I trust him, okay? But I can't believe, I really don't believe that they felt strong when God told them to be strong. I mean, think about this. Think about hearing about the promise, but never entering into the promise for 40 years. I don't know about you, but I, I think there would be some levels of discouragement in my heart. And, and I know that today, that a lot of us here probably feel that way about some areas of our own life too. We don't feel victory, we don't feel strong, we probably feel more discouraged than anything. I would probably use the word, the word confused. I know that there's been some tough seasons in my life where I don't necessarily feel strong. I probably feel more confused, like, God, what is going on? God, I don't understand this. God, I don't understand this season. I don't understand this hardship. I don't understand what I'm going through right now. I don't really feel strong. I feel more confused than anything. So God says, I need you to be strong. The next word that God used was this, confident. Confident. What an interesting word choice by God. Because I absolutely believe that they did not feel confident. They probably felt the opposite. But God goes, I need you to be strong and I need you to be confident, not in what you see around you, not in what you feel around you. And I'm gonna tell you, I struggle with this as much as any other human in the world. Can I get an amen from anybody, right? What I see and what I feel oftentimes can dictate how I perceive what God is doing in my life. And the Lord will go, no, 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 I, I need you to not see what you see right now. I need you to see with a different perspective, with supernatural eyes because what you feel at the moment can really dictate your heart and where it's going. And so I, I believe that they don't feel confident. I, I probably think that Israel felt confident the day that God brought them out of slavery. Yeah, what a great day. I mean, the Bible tells us that as probably two million Israelites left Egypt, 
that God healed every single one of them, healed their bodies, that God took the wealth of the Egyptians and gave it to them, and they were headed to the wilderness to worship the Lord and go to where? The promised land. I'm sure that they felt real confident on that day. I'm sure they felt real confident on the day where they were trapped against the sea and they saw their enemy, Egypt, coming to slaughter them and take them back to slavery, yet God opened the sea, sent them across on dry land, and then their enemy went into the sea and God drowned their enemy. I'm sure that was a real confident day. What an awesome day. But again, they, they've been in the desert. They've now been in the desert, I, I did the math, 2008, 2,087 weeks in the desert. They've been uh, 14,609 days in the desert. Confident cannot be what they feel. All right, so let's go to the next word. Uh, courageous. Courageous. Uh, a few years ago, uh, unfortunately, my mom uh, passed away from cancer. Uh, my mom actually... Um, it was 54 years, same length of time uh, that my grandma that I grew up with uh, passed away too. Um, it was a hard couple years there uh, watching her go through that. And, um, but I was excited. I, and I listen, I, I, to this day, I'm so excited that she's in heaven. I said at her funeral, I said, she wouldn't come back if she could. Amen? I wouldn't. I'm sorry. If the Lord took me home and said, hey, do you want to go back? I'd be like, peace out. <laughs> I am happy to be home with Jesus, okay? And um, here's what I know about that season. I didn't feel real courageous in that season, right? It wasn't a real courageous season of my life that I felt like I want to go tackle some big things. And I have to believe that this is how Israel feels. Moses, their leader, right? The one who was their rescuer, the one who led them out of slavery, has now died and he has gone on. And I'm sure that there is a large group of people inside of the camp of Israel that thought, now what? Right? Like God took us out of Egypt. He saved us and he rescued us. And then we went to the wilderness. And But now our leader's gone and we're stuck here. Now what? Where do we go? Where do we look? Where do we turn? So it's so incredibly interesting that God uses these words, strong, confident, courageous, when they didn't feel that way. And I know this, anytime that I've gone through a hard season of my life, and maybe some of you will, you know, express the same feeling, I know that I need what I need for the next season is I need some voices that are strong support and encouragement for me to help me get to where God wants me to go, right? That, that's why it is so beautiful to have relationship with other believers, that you have other believers and people that will speak into your life and give you a strength, a, a, a help to go into that next season of your life. Because here's what I know about God. God wants to speak. God wants to speak to you. Now, just like you, I deal with it on the same level. I'm sure that there are some days that I'm really tuned in really well, and then there's some days where the channel is fuzzy. Right? But God wants to speak. He's not not speaking. Me and, uh, me and Ryan Erdl on... Uh, what was that, Friday? Yeah, Friday we were talking about this. He reminded me of this book I read. It's a great pastor called Brother Hagen, okay? Pastor Brother Hagen. And uh, he wrote a book called Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. And um, in this book, he was talking about how he had a dream from the Lord, and the Lord was speaking to him face to face. And he said it was wonderful. 
just me and Jesus. He's speaking directly to me. He's saying wonderful things about my life and my future. And he said, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's like, this little demon came into the picture. And this little demon, and I'm just telling you what the book said. He said, the little demon starts going, yuckity, yuck, yuck, yuck. Yuckity, yuck, yuck, yuck. And, and he said, and then the demon started filling the place with smoke. And he, and he thought to himself, he thought to himself, Get out of here. I, I, I'm having a conversation with Jesus. You're distracting me. You're distracting my conversation. And I think a lot of times there's a moment, and this is what me and Ryan were talking about, where we're just distracted. The Lord wants to speak, and I'll show you. John chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who seeks, uh, sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and not a robber, but anyone who enters through the gate uh, through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he gathers his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because what? They know his voice. You are designed, okay? And I wanna say this real clearly. Regardless if you've ever felt the Lord speak to you or not, I promise you that God has designed you in a way to hear his voice. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to know his voice. This is the heart of God. He's designed you this way. God loves you, he knows you, and God will lead you to freedom when we're listening to his voice, right? Now, how many go, I don't listen to his voice all the time? Right, liars. I mean, all of you. I got my hand way up high, and you're all staring at me like, good for you. <laughs> yeah? Now, here, I want you to write this down if you're writing things down today. God will speak into your weaknesses, not your strengths. God will speak not to your strengths, but he'll speak into your weaknesses. So when God is speaking, he is speaking strong, confident, courageous. Why? Because they're weak. They don't see themselves this way. They don't believe this. So God is going, this is your weakness. I'm going to speak what? My power, my grace, my ability into your weaknesses. Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. What are people saying about me, the son of man? Who do they believe that I am? They answered, some are convinced that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elisha reincarnated or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked them a really important question. He goes, no, 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 you're not getting it. I know what everybody else says. I'm asking you what you believe. This is so important to our life. The Lord goes, I know what everybody else is saying about your life. But what, but what do you know? Everybody's gonna have an opinion about your life. We live in the most opinionated season of the world ever. I mean, they're, they're looking at every part of you and judging, you know, are you right, are you wrong? Having their thoughts, their perspectives. So it's really important that you're able to answer this question. No, 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 no. Not what everybody else is saying. What, what is the Lord saying? What is the Lord saying over my life? Simon spoke up and he said, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are favored and privileged, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For you did not discover this on your own, but my Father in heaven has supernaturally revealed this to you. Supernaturally. Now, here's what I know about God. When I want him to, and I desire for him to, he does. But when my heart isn't turned in that direction, I, what do you get? You get a lot of nothing. You get a lot of quiet. Because your heart, the position of your heart isn't turned to going, God, okay, I wanna hear supernaturally, I wanna see supernaturally what you have to say. And then he says this, I give you the name Peter. So he changes his name. He said you were Simon, but now you're Peter. Stone, other versions say rock. And the Lord says, and on this rock, this will be the bedrock foundation on which I build my church. And the Bible says, and the power and the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Now, here's what's so interesting. I have so appreciate this about God. I just love God for this so much. Jesus only speaks what he hears from the Father, correct? He can't speak anything else. Whatever the Father tells him is what he speaks. So he's only speaking what he hears from the Father. So he speaks over Simon. He says, hey, I'm gonna change your name. Now, in, when he's changing his name, he's also doing what? He's changing who he is. He's changing his identity. He's saying, you were once this, but now you're going to be this. And he calls him rock and he says, I'm gonna build my church on you, Peter. That, the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world is gonna be built on Peter, right? So God the Father uses Jesus and he speaks a blessing over Peter and his future, correct? But here's what God already knows. He knows that there's going to be a day where he completely fails. <laughs> Man. He knows there's gonna be a day that Peter, not once, not twice, but three times, will actually deny the existence of Jesus. Yeah, he says, you're the one I'm gonna build a church on. He knows that there is a day, even though the Father has supernaturally revealed to Peter, this is Jesus, the Messiah, my son, the one, the Lamb of God, that will give his life to take the sin of the world away, be resurrected. He reveals that to him, yet God knows there's a day that Peter's gonna go, yeah, I don't know that guy. That there would be people that would go, no, no, we've seen you with him. You've been with him for the last three years. We've watched you. And he'd go, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I've never seen that guy. I don't know who that guy is. So let me ask this question then. Did God prematurely speak over Peter? Was God in heaven like, oh, dang it. Shoot. Man, I really thought he was the guy. I thought Peter was the one. I thought, I thought we were gonna do some great things together, but oh man, I really missed that one. You know, did, was God in heaven on the throne going like, really messed that one up? What a mistake. I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> no. Let me tell you what God was doing, okay? God was releasing strength into what? His weakness. Just like God is releasing strength into Israel's weakness. God, when he speaks over him, is going, no, 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 I know that's who you 
once were, and I know you'll make mistakes still. And here's what, that's what I love about God. He is so kind and tolerant and merciful to allow us to make mistakes, but he goes, I see you not for your mistake. I see you for who you will become and who you will become will be victorious and he won't be hindered by this weakness anymore. Right? So God speaks, he speaks power and grace into him, why? Because Peter, Peter has a fear of man, right? Peter is a fear of people, pleasing people, wants to please people. God's speaking over him. Now, how will God speak to you, right? If God is gonna speak to you, we need to know how he will speak to you. So there's a few different ways. Number one is this, okay? He'll speak to you through the Word of God. That's why the Word of God is important in our life. He'll speak to you through the Word of God. He'll give you a promise. You'll be reading a verse in the Bible, and you'll go, I really believe this is for me right now in the season that I'm in. And you hold on to that promise, and you speak that promise, and you pray that promise. So God will speak to you through the Word of God. Sometimes God will give you a prophetic word. Somebody will have a word of knowledge that they'll speak over you. Sometimes God will use somebody in your life to speak to you. God will reveal something to them and then God will help you through a relationship. But the one I love so dearly is just the Holy Spirit. It's called the still small voice. And let me give you a heads up. The only way you can hear that voice is if you quiet all the other voices. And I'm not gonna tell you that that's always easy because there's, just like me, just like you, we all have a lot of people's voices running in our head. And we have the world's voice running in our head. But there's something beautiful about when you can quiet the world. You know, something beautiful. I love my basement right now. I turn the lights off. Yeah, I run into the pole a couple times, you know, <laughs> to be honest. But there's no noise. It's dark, it's quiet. And I know I'll find the Holy Spirit there. And God will speak to you. And when he speaks to you, he'll speak into your weaknesses because he wants to bring you freedom. He wants us to live in freedom. Verse seven, Joshua one, verse seven. He said, only be strong and very courageous. He speaks it again. Verse nine, he says, I've commanded you to be strong and courageous. So now he has not said it once, not twice, but three times. Three times he's like, hey, I need you to be strong. I need you to be courageous. I need you to be confident. He says, do not. He says, do not be terrified and dismayed, intimidated, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, it is really easy in life to get dismayed and intimidated. I, I have been fighting this for a while now. And I think it's not just me, I think it's the church, I think it's the church as a whole, like the capital C church. The enemy is trying to intimidate the church because he doesn't want the church to be strong and bold and courageous. He wants the church to be questioning themselves and the church to be always thinking, is this right, is, this, is, is it okay if I speak this out? You know, I mean, I was, again, me and Ryan were talking the other day just about, you know, even in the summertime, we, 
we made some bold decisions from the stage to talk about that we are for life and we are for you know babies being bored and not killing babies and 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 listen for as many of you that are like yes we are so thankful that we have a pastor that will say that there was also other families that said no we we do not believe in this and we are leaving and the enemy will try to intimidate you to shut your mouth You might be intimidated by life. Maybe business hasn't been as good as it was in years past. Maybe you're entering into a season you've never been before. You know, I've had a lot of conversations with families in our church where they're like, man, we're entering into like teenage seasons and like, what the heck is happening? <laughs> you know? And they're like, it's intimidating, it's scary. Maybe, maybe you're intimidated by the failures of your past. I won't make you raise your hand, but I know that so many of us in here, we are hindered in our future because we are so focused on our failures of our past. And there's so much guilt and there's so much shame and there's so many, man, I can just feel the Lord on that so deeply. There's so much guilt and shame. That's all you can see about yourself and you're intimidated. But the Lord gave them a commandment. Do not be terrified or dismayed. The Lord said, wherever you go, I will be with you. And I think you just gotta let that sink in just a little bit. That the Lord goes, I know that this next season of your life, I know where I'm leading you. I know, I need you to trust me that I'm with you. I'll, I'll, I'll stand next to you. He told him, don't be worried. I won't leave you, I won't abandon you. Where you go, I will go with you. And I feel the Lord saying that to you today. I'm with you wherever you go. I'll follow you. Second Timothy, verse one, I mean, chapter one, verse six, it says this. I'm writing to encourage you to fan the flame well, the spiritual gifts imparted to you when I laid hands on you. That's what I love about this upcoming Wednesday night, the worship night. You get to fan the flame of the Spirit of God. You get to fan the flame of the Holy Spirit. You get to fan the flame of the things of God. I love worship nights. We just get to take away the time limits. We get to take away, you know, the stress of another service that's coming. And we just get to go, Lord, we just want to worship you. We want your presence to fall we want your presence to be here the holy spirit to come and fan the flame of our heart that's why we're having a worship night amen to rest in his grace he said this for god will never give you a spirit of fear but the holy spirit gives you mighty power love and self-control the lord will never lead you out of fear Fear will never lead you to freedom. What will lead you to freedom? His power and his grace when he speaks over you. It will lead you and your family to freedom. Now, I'm gonna end with this, okay? I was there in bed and I was just thinking about, all right, God, you spoke over them three times. And I was just thinking, that's interesting, three times, and I was thinking, of, of the number three, and I was just like, Lord, what is this three, this three thing? And the Holy Spirit just said, Jesus, duh. It just kind of like that to me, like, come on, like, Jesus died and was dead for three days, and then on what? The third, God resurrected him, so God speaks to Israel three times what is God doing God is telling Israel listen I'm about to resurrect the promise that I had on your life see the Old Testament always points to Jesus the Old Testament is always a roadmap to Jesus and so God is saying to Israel hey listen I know that you feel dead in the wilderness I know that you feel like I've forgotten you. I know that you feel, you know, you don't feel strong. You don't feel mighty. You don't feel courageous. You don't feel it. But I'm about to resurrect something in your life. I'm about to resurrect my promise. 
My promises are yes and amen. I never forget my promise. I never forget what I speak. And I'm about to take something and resurrect it in your life just like I resurrected Jesus on the third. I'm about to do something in your life. Come on. So let's go back to the beginning. Verse 6, Joshua 1, verse 6. These are not just words for that time. They're words for today. They're words for you. Can I just challenge you? Let this, let this come alive to you right now. Like, don't, don't just skip over this moment. Uh, I understand you're hungry. I'm hungry, okay? Right? Don't let this skip over right now. Th listen, let these words wash over you. Let them get into you. Let it be the Lord speaking this to you today. Not just some arbitrary story in the Old Testament, but it's for you personally today. And the Lord goes, church, be strong. Be strong. You're stronger in my grace and power than you could ever think you are. Be strong. Be strong in me. Be strong in my strength. Be confident. Have a confidence that you know that wherever you go and whatever you face and whatever challenge that you meet and whatever failure that you're going to fail, just like Peter, be confident that even when you fail, the Lord is with you and he's got you and he will hold you up and he will take you to victory. Be confident. Be confident. And be courageous. Be courageous. Be courageous to talk to people about Jesus right now. Be courageous to tell people about the great things of God that are happening in your life. Be courageous in the Lord. This world needs a light to shine to them. When you go to work, when you go to your kids' sporting events, when you're at the gym, be courageous. Don't let the enemy intimidate you. Don't let the enemy shut your mouth. Be courageous. Your God is with you. He gives you his strength. I promise you, Peter could not have become who he was without confidence and being courageous in the Lord. It wasn't in him, but it was in the Lord. Amen? Why don't you stand up this morning? Come on, can we raise our hands? Lord, I just thank you for your strength. Come on, thank him for his strength, not your strength. Lord, we thank you, God that our past, our failures, our mistakes don't define us, but you define us. Father, thank you for freedom in your spirit, freedom in your presence, freedom, joy, confidence, and strength. Thank you, Lord. Come on, sing this out. 